I'm Sunny J, and we're here at Sunny J Live. We're going to talk about the ins and the outs, the ups, the downs, the crazy turnarounds, the slips, the trips, the stumbles, and the falls. But most importantly, the get back ups as we together engage in this thing called life. And today, my guest is Rosalind B., the author and executive producer of Looking in the Mirror. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. And I know my viewers are too. They have lots and lots of questions for you, so let's get started. So tell us, what's the inspiration behind Looking in the Mirror? I would say the inspiration is because of the struggles and issues that I went through in my life. I always said, let me share my story so that it can give someone else hope. Sometimes when you're going through these struggles and these issues, you feel like you're alone and there's nobody else that understands or been through it or understand what you're going through. Now, for those that have not read the book or seen the movie, tell us some of the struggles you went through. I went through struggles like I grew up in a home of child abuse, bullying, um, tried to commit suicide as a kid, then I teenage pregnancy, then I got married into a volatile relationship where there was lots of domestic violence, um, incarceration, just to name um, a little bit about what I went through. So what made you decide to share the book now? What made you decide to share your story? Um, I was at home one day and I was just sitting, sitting down watching TV. I had just got through praying. Um, even though you know we pray every day, but it was one of those crying out prayers. So when I got through, it just hit my spirit. It's like God put it in my spirit, hey, you need to write a book. So I was like, huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to write no book. I don't want to tell my story. I don't want to tell people my secrets and, you know, my skeletons that I've been hiding and the dog keep, you know, digging in the ground, trying to unbury them or stuff we sweep under the rugs. Because, you know, keep your secrets at home. So, but you know when God has something for you, he won't leave you alone. He'll keep. You'd be sitting there watching TV, bing, write that book. <laughs> or you'd be watching dishes, bing, write that book. So I said, okay, let me be obedient and go ahead and write it. So that's what I did. That's awesome. And I'm going to tell you one interesting fact that a lot of people don't know um, that you are the care, I'm sorry, the caregiver or the caretaker for your father, right? Yes. And that's amazing. So if they've read the book or saw the music, movie, they would know what that meant. If they read the book, or saw the movie, they would know how amazing that is. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, caring for a person that has dementia, it's really hard. It's a struggle. Um, it has, every day is something different because there's different types of dementia that I never do anything about. Um, so caring for my dad, it's like you're babysitting a kid. I don't know if you ever heard that saying where they said once an adult, twice a kid. Yeah. So that's the what I'm going through with my dad, um, trying to keep him safe, keep him from getting into, you know, stuff that he shouldn't be in. Because you're worried about their safety just like a kid, just like you wouldn't keep medicine bottles or medicine around for a kid. It's the same you have to do for my dad. You have to make sure there's some medicine, anything that can be harmful. To him, you have to keep it out of his sight, keep it away from him, keep him safe, as well as make sure he's eating properly because sometimes he forgets how to feed himself wow. or, you know, he forgets how to, you know, walk or he, he stands there for a minute. You're like, walk, walk, walk. So I make songs out of stuff to, like, you know, walk, walk, walk. And then you go, oh, okay, then he walks. Right. Or if I hit him with spoon, you know, when you hand him his food, or he just sits there and then he'll start like maybe digging with his hand and you're like, ah, 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 ah. Then you take the spoon and tap it, you know, remember, remember. And then you put it in his hand and then he sometimes, oh, and then he'll feed himself and some days I have to feed him. So it's just little stuff like that. It, it's a lot. That sounds like a lot. So how do you feel about taking care of him at this point in time after everything that you've gone through? I love my dad and it's kind of bittersweet because my dad was real hard on me growing up because I'm, I'm the outside kid. I'm the side piece 
kid, side chick, kid, whatever you want to say. So I never right really had my dad um, to be loving and kind. He was always mean or strict, and you know it was always a separated a separation with the kids with his wife, and then you got the outside kid over here. We're gonna do this together, and I'll see you later. You stay over here, you know. So. I didn't get to learn a lot of stuff about my dad, but now that I've been caring for my dad for almost three years, I find out stuff about my dad that I didn't know before. Like, I didn't know he could see. I didn't know he's a comedian at times, so I, I guess that's where I get my jokes, jokes and stuff from my dad. And I, you know, sometimes he tells stories about his life and when he was a kid and stuff he did, and you're like, wow, but this is stuff that I never knew about my dad before, so I embrace the time that I have with my dad now, learning all of this and hearing all of this. So I just take each day as a blessing, even though it's bittersweet because of his mental capacity now, but I still look at it as a blessing. Right. Creating memories for now that right. you didn't have back then, right? right? And that is amazing. So if you don't understand about that, read the book or watch the movie, right? right? Um, another thing, like our viewers have been asking, Give them some tips about how would you start to write a book? If you're going to write a book, I would say get a notebook pad and jot down stuff like and line it up so that because you have chapters so that you have everything in each chapter that's pertaining to that subject and then write. You know, take notes, jot down different stuff that you don't forget. Because you may be writing over here and think of something that can go in chapter 10. So just jot it down so that when you get to chapter 10, it goes with that chapter. You can remember it. So that's all I would say. It's like a journal. Just write. Right. Absolutely. First, just take the step and write. <laughs> you got to write, right? Because you'll never have a book if you don't get started, right? Right. So once they have that book, what next? Then they have to find a publisher. So I don't know, like, I, I, I went through a publishing company, but some people want to self-publish. So you have to do your research and find out what's better for you, what's better for your pockets, whether you want to publish or self-publish. Um, but then you have to, you know, there's, there's packages, you know, you have to do editing, you know. So you have to see what package fits your budget, what's best for you to get your book out there. So they need to do some research. They need to do right? some research. Got to do some research. And Now, how long did it take you to write your book? Well, once I decided to go ahead and write it and tell all my secrets and pull all my skeletons out, <laughs> it took me about, I would say, two and a half to three days at the most to write my book. And when I started writing, it just flowed. It just flowed. Also, when I was writing my book, it was a cleansing. I just want to ask you that. It was a cleansing. It was a release. Because, and I say that because these are secrets and skeletons and dark stories that I kept on the inside all my life. This is stuff that people bury under the rug. Because, you know, as a kid, you were brought up in my era. What goes on in my house stays in the house. Right. You know, you don't tell the, the secrets of the family. Absolutely. So when I was able to write this book, it was a release, a release and a cleansing because I never got a chance all my life to tell my story. You know, even when kids that went to school with me, they didn't know my story. My kids didn't know my story until they knew some of it, but to actually read it and, and see like, whoa, I, you know, I still have people, my old schoolmates, wow, I, I walk to school with you every day. You never said anything. So when I was able to put all of this in a book, it's a release. And then I had a final cry. Because even though you cry throughout all your struggles and issues through life as a kid, you know, one of your parents, whatever your issues are, you know, you cried all those tears and you think you're done. And as we get older, we bury stuff. We bury and we bury and we bury and we bury. Mm -hmm. But then when you write a book, and you're unloading and it's kind of like pulling a scab off of a wound because now you got to deal with that hurt all over again 
So as I was writing about different topics and different situations that I went through, the tears just flowed because you think you're over it, mm -hmm. but really you're not over with over it because you never dealt with it. Right. You just buried it. So as I began to write my book and I was able to release, I was able to release and, and find peace and, and, and forgiveness of what I had gone through in my life and have love and compassion regardless of what I went through, how much hurt I went through, how much pain I went through, how no matter how many times I wanted to give up, even to the point where I tried to commit suicide at the age of 11. So writing a book is good. It's, it's a way out. It's a way to release all that hurt and to let it go. It's a way to you know, say, okay, you know, I went through this at this time, you know, even with the bullying in school, kids not liking you, picking at you for mm -hmm. things that you had no control of. You're right. able to fully release and forgive. I have a lot of my bullies that are my Facebook friends now and that are actually congratulating me on my book. Absolutely. So it's a, it's, it's great. It's a great feeling to be able to release. And that was and a long time go. coming. Long time coming, right? So did your relationships change with your family, like with your daughters? Did it, did it change at all? After they read the story or watched the movie, did it change? It gave a lot of people understanding of why she's like she is. Or now I understood why she did what she did. Um, some people, some family members was very encouraging. And then I... Um, I had some people, not it, it wasn't it wasn't family, but I had some people that was upset with me. You know, I even got threatened. Like, you wrote that book? Why how dare you? How could you? And as a matter of fact, the person that threatened me was uh, and my abuser, my ex husband. Um, but yeah, I was threatened about writing the book. I was put down for writing the book. You know, you have people that say Domestic violence is bad, you know, never let anybody hit on you, never do this and that. Um, but as soon as they find out it's one of their family members, oh, well, maybe you did something to deserve that, or maybe you did something wrong. No, if it's wrong, it's wrong. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if it's my dad, my brother, my cousin, my, you're wrong, you're wrong. Absolutely. So I'm not going to say it's wrong, and then when it's your family member who does it, now you make excuses. So it's kind of like you're condoning that behavior. And that's the problem. And that is and that is why I go so hard trying to talk to people because that is the same mentality that keeps a lot of people from opening up and sharing their hurt or their story or whatever they're going through. It's a lot of hidden victims. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, that is amazing. Um, that, I mean, even the fact that somebody's going to threaten you about writing about it, writing your truth, because that's your truth. Right. You know? Now, okay, you got this book. How did that book become a movie? Okay. So I reached out, um, I went on Facebook, matter of fact, and I saw it when I said, I want my book to become a movie. I just threw it out there and just wrote it. And I was looking back at that last year and I was like, whoa, I threw that out in the atmosphere five years ago and it is now in existence. So I did my research. I was looking around for producers because I didn't know anything about nothing. All I know is I watch movies on TV. That's it. So then I uh, talked to some people and somebody referred me to a guy named James Hunter that has uh, First Dibs Entertainment. And I reached out to him and I talked to him and he was, you know, giving me diff different rules and laws or whatever that you go by. And then he gave me a budget. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. So I was like, okay, Lord, well, I did say I want my book to reach millions. I said, so Lord, what are we going to do to get this money? Because that's a lot of money. <laughs> but I know that a lot of people will watch a movie when they won't read a book. Right. And then it's vice versa. Absolutely. But in order for it to reach millions, and that was my dream, I wanted to do both. So um, about eight months, ten months later, um, I was able to get the money and start the movie. So 
that is how the book became a movie. Well, as they say, with the vision comes what? Provision, right? So right. absolutely, and it's it's a wonderful movie and a wonderful book. Right. So what was that filming experience like for you? You like on the set and all that. What was that like for you? Oh, M-G. <laughs> <laughs> I have never, when you watch movies, you just don't know all the work that's behind the scene. Absolutely. So, I mean, the casting, uh, hiring the crew, the people, the makeup artists, the, the wardrobe people, and then whatever era that movie, right. if it's in the 60s, they got to find clothing for that era, uh, cars, uh, furniture, or whatever, everything. everything. Makeup, wig, whatever hairstyle was bad. I mean, wow. All I can say is OMG. It, it's a great experience. Um, I was like a kid in a candy store. It was so, it was awesome to me. It was amazing watching the cast. Um, I got to meet a lot of, I got to meet Dorian Wilson from the Parkers. Um, and I, and I said to him, he said, and the only reason I'm bringing this up because he said something profound to me. I said, Dory, you will say that we shook hands and stuff. And he said, you have a great story. And I said, thank you. I said, God has jokes. He said, what do you mean? I said, because when I was younger, me and my grandmother used to watch you on TV on the Parkers with Monique chasing you around. And he was like, yeah. And then I said, and now you're in my little movie. <laughs> and he said, never say Little, little movie. Absolutely. He said, just say your movie. Absolutely. He said, because everything great started somewhere small. And he, he gave me a dap and that just stood with me. So big up to Dorian Wilson. But, and I was able to see Will Smith's sister, Ashley Marie, Ava Bar, Avis Barnes from Greenleaf. Trey so she's Jane. in the movie. These are people in the movie. These are people that are in my movie. I'm not going to say my little movie. These are people that are in my movie and they're they believe in the story and they said they read the script and they accepted it and they liked it and I'm like wow you know and plus we got local you know local talent too as well I just thank everybody each and every one that participated that made my dream come true made my book into this movie and I'm I, the filming experience is phenomenal if it, it, hey if you've never been on a set Go on and say it'll give you a whole out, new outlook on how, on what really goes behind the hard work that the cast and crew put into these movies. Absolutely. So when they, when you see budgets and they say this no, this film costs millions and millions of dollars and you look at those credits, I mean, they list everything from the drivers to the people that <laughs> fed them, you know, to the assistants, to yes. the assistants, assistants. Yes. I mean, it's a whole bunch of people on a movie set, right? Yes. Well, that is amazing. Now, how many days did you actually go to the set? Um, I probably went to the set maybe 13 days out of a 21 filming period. Because at the time, I still had my grandsons. Um, they were younger in school, and I was still, you know, rearing them as well as my dad. So Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so the book is not a movie. You've been on the set. How did it feel to see it actually on the screen? Oh, my God, like, <sighs> <laughs> breathtaking. Breathtaking, breathtaking. Because when you look, that's just like when I first saw my book, it took me like three days to write the book. And then the publisher told me it would take 45 to 65 days, 45 to 60 days. My book was in my hand, um, literally within two weeks. Wow. So that's why I tell people, I'm going to say this real quick, I'm going to put this answer. That's why when you're obedient to God, well, he'll make it flow. He makes it flow. I mean, you don't, you don't have to, oh, you, oh, it just falls right into place. I'll just say that. But anyway, um, the book, the movie, it's just a feeling seeing it on the screen and you're like, wow, this, I did this. Look, Roslyn from Winter Park, little town called Winter Park. The little girl that was told that she would never amount to anything, that she would never be nothing. I was told this at eight years old. 
What does an eight year old understand about being told you, you're never going to mount to anything? Where's you don't understand so that. Power? You don't understand that. And then you're nine and 10 and you're running away and you're still hearing, you ain't going to be nothing. You ain't going to do this. You ain't going to do that. So to, for me to see my name on a book and my name on a movie credit, it's phenomenal. That's all I can say is breathtaking. It just makes me feel good. It lets me know that I'm on the right course. I'm giving back. I'm giving somebody else hope. I'm empowering somebody. It's the greatest feeling in the world. It is. Um, I can't. I can see the joy in you and the and the pride in you. And and you should feel great about your accomplishment. And I know there's a lot more to come. Now the film right now is top ten on Tubi. Where else can they see it? Okay, you can see it on NBC Peacock, Sling TV, Hoopla, and Voodoo. And I don't know if any other platforms is coming up. We don't. Absolutely. <laughs> and where can they find the book? The book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart Online, Target Online. And if you Google Looking in the Mirror by Rosalind B. Jones, um, it's other websites that have it available. Absolutely. So, book, movie, what is next for Rosalind B? Book two, movie two. <laughs> Uh, speaking engagements. Um, I want to. I would like to do more speaking engagements, and I and, and I'm gonna say why because my struggle started as a kid going through child abuse. So the speaking engagements that I have done, when I have went and talked to other kids, other kids have come out. Some of them hugged me. Some of them was telling me some of their story. I didn't have enough time to listen to all of them. They would line up. And they would tell me, oh, I went through that, oh, I'm going through that right now, or the bullying part, what should I do? And, you know, some little girl, you know, showed me where she's cutting and stuff. Let me tell you this. I was going through so much as a kid that when I didn't see any other way out, that is the reason why I tried to commit suicide when I was only 11 years old. So when I see now how... For instance, Regina King, her son just committed suicide, 26 years old. Not only celebrity kids, we got other kids, everyday Every kids day. that are doing this on a regular. And they're doing it because they feel like they have no one to talk to, they have no one to turn to. Because when I decided that morning, you know what? I'm just going to check out. I'm done. I'm done. Nobody understands me. I'm being abused at home. I'm being bullied in school. I don't have my mom in my life. I don't have my dad like I should. So what else is there? I don't have any friends that I trust to talk to. You know, I don't feel comfortable. So what else is there? So you know, that's gotta be a very, very low place in a person's life that they wanna give up. Yeah. Absolutely. So that is the reason why I go so hard. That's the reason why I talk so hard to so many people. Because I don't want them to give up. Because there is hope. That's why I try to encourage people, empower people, and let them know I'm a product of that. Right. I've been there. But I made it out. So I want to encourage people and give them hope to let them know that they can make it out too. And that's why I talk so hard. That's why I go so hard. And people are like, what are you talking about? Because if you could just see all the people that are in dark, darkness. Absolutely. So I know there's lots of people that reach out to you after yes. they read the book or have seen the movie. How would our viewers connect with you? Um, I'm on Instagram, Rosalind Davis Jones. I'm on Facebook, Rosalind Davis Ingram. I'm on TikTok, Rosalind Ingram. And Twitter, Rosalind Davis Jones. And the reason why there's so many names, and this is why we go by Rosalind <laughs> <Lee> is what? <laughs> because my maiden name is Davis, so a lot of people know me that went to school with me and stuff from Davis. Jones is one of my married names, which is the, the book is under Jones. And then Ingram is my name now. So that's why we say Rosalind B. Absolutely, right? <laughs> so we know who we're talking about, Rosalind right. B. Well, you know, it's, it's so inspiring and so encouraging, you know. 
And I'm sure people are reaching out. How does it make you feel when people reach out to you and tell you, I read the book and this is how it affected me? How does that make you feel? That makes me feel so good. Um, since the movie came out, wow, people from all over everywhere, North Carolina, Ohio, Arkansas, um, Los Angeles, people are reaching out and they're telling me, and a young lady reached out today from Georgia, and they're telling me that my book is relatable, how my book, you know, they some people say they read how my movie is relatable as well as the book, but how they watched the movie two times, three times. One lady said she watched it three times and then again with her family during the holidays. Um, it makes me feel good. They're like, what? We, we want more. Where's more? Or can you come to our state? Can you come to North Carolina? Can you come here? I'm like, okay. I would love to come and meet, meet everyone if I could. But I know that I can't. So my book and my movie speaks for me. But what I want to say is I love when people reach out to me and they're asking me or they're telling me their story because everyone has testimonies. Absolutely. Some are braver than others to tell it. But um, it feels great when people reach out to you and say, hey, I can relate. Hey, I, I, gone, I went through that. Hey, you don't look like what you went through. Keep inspiring others. Hey, you're a big inspiration to me. That makes me feel good. That's why I, I don't do it for, for fame or fortune. I do it because I'm passionate about it and I want to help give people hope. I want to help save lives. I want people to be able to look and say, you know what? Even if, even when they're at their lowest and their darkest moment, they can look at me and see God's light and grace on me and say, you know what? Let me try what she tried. Let me give that a try. Let Absolutely. me pick myself up. Look for some resources. Yeah. Reach out. Tell Let somebody. me reach out. Maybe right. I can reach out to her and she can give me, because I people reach out to me and I talk to them and I give them my opinion, you know? But I love that. Yeah. It means a lot to me. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So you can definitely reach out to her. She'd love to hear from you. <laughs> definitely. It means a lot. Now, I know you also did some acting. So yes. Tell us where they can see you at. What okay. Films? So I'm in uh, Don't Shoot the Messenger. Um, Breakup Masters is on Amazon Prime. Um, I did a cameo appearance in my movie, so if you want to see me again, you gotta look at my movie. Um, cause that was your voice. That was my voice. I did the voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I'm in, uh, 45 seconds, and that movie is still being edited to this day. So. So Y'all got some parts it. for me? <laughs> Absolutely. So you'd like to do some more acting? Yes. I would love to do some more acting. I like it. Awesome. Well, you know what? I am so happy that you joined us today. Very inspirational, very encouraging, very uplifting, very empowering. I know there's a lot of people that can relate to the story. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing so much more from you, like part two for okay. the book and the movie. And the movie. And on that note, stay tuned. Here comes the trailer of Looking in the Get up. I'm sorry I've been bad. I promise I'll be good for now on. My mom had gotten in the habit of dropping me off with totally different strangers. One day while my mom was doing one of her vanishing acts, my aunt Cece dropped me off to my point? grandmother on my dad's side named Beatrice. Boy, I sure didn't know what I was getting myself into. Then I changed my life. Then I was sentenced to prison and pregnant. I'm Dr. Lewis and this is Nurse Thomas. Relax. Okay. So I ended up going back to jail. I still couldn't get it right. And I met a girl named Tammy, and we became fast friends. And she introduced me to her brother, E. I'm gonna end up putting a ring right there on that thing. I ain't playing. You drive a hard bargain, baby. You crazy. Go get your shit, and let's go. I'm not coming Go get your shit. Whoa, come on. I don't deserve this. So what, you gonna shoot me? If we ask you to do something, you do it. Right. Why did you take that money from my purse? Will you go come over here with this? Oh, you came here to play, huh? I'm ready to take things to the next level. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sunny J with Sunny J Live, and I look forward to seeing you again real soon.